Guys, we've waited so long for this. After almost four years and what seemed like an endless trail of breadcrumbs without anything really concrete, it felt like it would never really happen. But Intel is finally launching the graphics cards. And you know what? Now that we got more information, I've gone from being tired of being led around in circles for so long to, well, sort of excited, I guess. Like they say, Rome was never built in a day. And in this case, yes, there's still gonna be some wait. I know, I know the whole hurry up and wait thing has been a pain in the ass, but our GPUs are coming in April. That's what you need to know. Just not in the way a lot of you might have hoped because they're actually launching on laptops first. But this could be a good thing too. Okay, let me explain how this all shakes out in the simplest way possible. While Intel's XE architecture has been around for a while, XE HPG or high performance graphics is where things start to get fun for gamers and creators. These cards will be broken into three subcategories with the first one being the ARC 3 series, which is just an entry-level mobile set of GPUs that'll be available in laptops launching next month. That'll be followed in the early summer by ARC 5 and ARC 7. But what does this all mean from a performance standpoint? Well, ARC 3 will be geared towards entry-level GPU market for more casual gamers. So basically in more affordable laptops or thin and light devices like, you know, this, um, Flow X13 or the XPS 15. In those cases, it would replace something like the GTX 1650. The 5 and 7 series, well, they're meant for mid to high level gaming laptops, which means that yes, Intel is doing everyone hoped that they would. And that's competing with some of the best laptop GPUs uh, AMD and NVIDIA have to offer. Finally, some competition, eh? Now, I also wanted to talk about how these things are actually gonna be named since um, it's pretty straightforward but still sprinkled with a little bit of Intel's usual alphabet soup. Basically, the first part of the name denotes the generation, while the next three numbers show its positioning within each series. Meanwhile, the M tells you it's for the mobile market. Now, if you look at how that translates to ARC 3, the lowest end card would be called ARC A350M, while the next generation gets the ARC 370M treatment. And that naming scheme flows through the rest of Intel's lineup, or at least the products that they are announcing right now. So with that out of the way, let's get a bit deeper into what you need to know about XE HPG. And the first point that I need to make is that this isn't just an upscaled IGP. With all the changes, it's almost a brand new architecture from top or from top to bottom. Now, as these things are released, you'll be hearing a lot about what Intel calls their XE cores. Each XE core consists of 16 vector engines, which can be loosely compared to Intel's current execution units or EUs. There's also 16 matrix engines that are meant to be used for dedicated AI acceleration, like Intel's XESS upscaling technology. Four of those cores are grouped together along with the usual schedulers, raster engines, geometry units, ROPs, and whatnot into what's called a render slice. The slice also houses four ray tracing units, and yes, that means that there's fully hardware accelerated ray tracing support in these GPUs. Still with me? Well, that render scale is the building block making up the foundation of every XE HPG core. Right now, a total of eight of them are used for the higher end Alchemist dies. Um, the slices are also completely modular so they can be added or removed or disabled or enabled to create other layouts of the same design. But there are two baseline versions here. The ACM G10 die has a maximum of 32 cores for a total of 512 vector engines, while the lower end G11 that's used for the ARC3 lineup caps out at just eight for a total of 128 vector engines. What makes a CPU cooler different? Well, it starts with the basics like a direct touch base plate along with nickel plated heat pipes for maximum heat dissipation, a fan that respects your environment without sounding like a jet, an easy installation procedure for both Intel and AMD platforms, and the flexibility to work with different memory modules. But the real deal comes with the presentation of a CPU cooler, and Iceberg Thermal took a completely different direction with their iSleet G3 and G4 series by offering this unique multifaceted design on the exterior shell that looks absolutely sleek, especially in this teal version. These air coolers come in different flavors to fit your style. Learn more about the iSleet series down below. Now, if we take all of those technical stuff and translate it into actual specs, this is where things start to get really, really interesting because you can see exactly where Intel's targeting these new mobile GPUs. First of all, that first rollout of ARC 3 will clearly target the entry-level performance segment with hyper-efficient GPUs that sacrifice performance for power savings. That means 
a tiny 64-bit memory interface and just four gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. So yeah, the ARX 6500M is the target here for the A370M and maybe even a smaller performance step below that for the A350M. Then there's the big jump upwards to the ARC 5 A550M since it gets double of everything. The number of cores, ray tracing units, memory, bus width, it's all twice of what the A370M has. So expect this to be intended as a 6600M and RTX 3060 competitor, especially when you look at the way how the TDP lands. Finally, the ARC 7 is really where it's at for gaming performance. But these two GPUs are also the biggest question marks of Intel's new lineup, because they've got a lot to prove here. Because judging by their TDPs alone, they should be in the same category as the RTX 3070, ARC 6700M, RTX 3080, and the 6800M series. But it'll be interesting to see how that actually happens. Fingers crossed though. Now we should also mention the graphics clock Intel's showing here and needs a bit of explanation because they look super low compared to AMD and Nvidia. So think of this as the absolute minimum speed the core will be running in its lowest TDP setting instead of the average expected frequency like other companies show. Now, showing the lowest possible frequency might seem a bit odd, but I'm just guessing that, you know, it's just here as a placeholder, so Intel just doesn't give away too much information before it actually launches. Now look, I don't want to spend too much time on what Intel's claiming for performance because they're up to some of the usual shady marketing chart tricks that every other company pulls in their presentations. I mean, look at this. All we know is that, yes, the A370M paired with a 12700H is faster than the Iris XC graphics with an i7-1280P. I mean, it better be because that's the low power CPU meant for thin and light devices. But other than that, no values for the other competing solution, no y-axis and nothing that could give us an idea of what these results are. Same thing goes here as well. Great, you can play Rocket League at 105 frames per second, but what Intel's doing on these numbers raises red flags where it shouldn't. It makes it look like they're hiding something, especially when you see how close the integrated solution is to the A370M in Rocket League, even though the Arc GPUs is paired up with a much, much faster CPU. Just think about that for a second. The bigger red flag for me is the fact that there wasn't a single not one competitive benchmark against solutions from AMD and Nvidia. You see, it's not like Intel can't find a dozen of more laptops out there sporting a GTX 1650. So that's a bit worrying. Okay, maybe very worrying. Anyways, I'll store the rest of my rant for when we can actually get to test out these Arc-based systems. But until then, these GPUs do have a lot going for them beyond just raw specs and gaming performance. For example, there's a completely new media engine that offers full hardware encode and decode acceleration uh, for VP9, ABC, HVAC, and yes, even next-gen AV1 content. The supported resolutions are pretty amazing too, with decoding of up to 8K 12-bit HDR videos while encoding takes smaller step back to 10-bit HDR. There's also something called Intel Deep Link that's already been announced, but I don't think it's been getting the attention it deserves. It's basically a whole whack of technologies based on open source. That's right, open source APIs that leverages Intel's control over the CPU, integrated GPU, and discrete GPU in a single system. Some of them, like Dynamic PowerShare, mirror exactly what AMD and Nvidia have been doing over the last few years. All this does balance power between processors based on workloads. So if you're gaming, the GPU gets some extra juice. Um, if you need some more multi-core performance, well, the CPU is prioritized. As a creator, I'm actually more excited about things like hyperencode, um, since it leverages the media engines in the Intel's integrated and discrete graphics together. Now that means they can be used in parallel to complete encoding or decoding tasks a whole lot faster. Now Intel's already shown it working in programs like DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro, and you can actually see it working here on a DaVinci project. On the left-hand side is a traditional system with just the discrete GPU working, but with hyper-encode, both encoder engines get leveraged for much faster processing time. Obviously, this can make a huge impact on a ton of different workflows as well. It's just up to Intel and software manufacturers to roll out support for this feature. There's also HyperCompute that actually runs the iGPU and DGPU together on the same AI-centric task through the Open Vino Machine Learning Framework. I guess you could think of this as 
sort of SLI for some GPU accelerated professional tasks. So I guess that pretty much wraps things up. And guys, I have to say, everyone here at the team is actually a lot more excited for Intel's Arc than they were a few years ago. And look, I know a lower end mobile GPU lineup wasn't the first thing that we wanted, but it's what we got right now. And yes, there's still going to be a few months of waiting to see what Arc 5 and Arc 7 can do, but I completely understand what Intel's doing here. Because rolling out entry-level GPUs first allows them to test their technology and, of course, drivers in a much bigger and less demanding market that's focused on battery life, casual gaming, and mobile content creation. And when it comes to this space, I'm a bit more interested in what Arc 3 can do for programs like DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, Photoshop, Blender, and of course, some games as well. It could really offer some exciting stuff, provided Intel gets their driver game together. And that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? Because will Intel be able to deliver on the driver front or will it just be a mess? Because you can have all the GPU horsepower in the world, but it'll never be used properly if the drivers are just junk. And yes, Intel did show the new flashy and feature-packed ARC control center, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Amiibo with Hardware Connects. Thank you so much for watching. And uh, I'll talk to you guys in the next one.